Please get up, give it up for Jay Beal. He's going to take us through the next 50 minutes. Hey, everybody. I'll let, a, I'll let you file in just a little bit while I introduce my co-presenter. This is Justin Searle. He's our newest hire at Intel Guardians. And, uh, well, he's a badass guy. Um, so he's uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit of, we'll talk about a little bit more about him and his contributions to this talk, both positive and negative, uh, because I'm going to blame things on him, um, or at least that's what he thinks. So let's see. Here's what we're doing. I've been uh, I've been doing defensive programs for a long time, and somehow I've well spent about uh, six or seven years now pen testing and. And now and then, it, we end up creating some tools. So I'm releasing one. Um, and uh, you're going to be able to find this. I'll, um, I've got a URL at the end of the slide. You're going to be able to find this up on Intel Guardian's site uh, later this weekend when I get the bugs out. Um, so, um, but I'll tell you all about it right now. So basically, um, the, tool that, uh, the tool is called the Midler. Um, we tried and went through all kinds of names. What's that? Oh, hi, priest. Don't hurt me. Um, he is a very nice man who's got a weight ratio of three to one on me. <laughs> and I'm telling you it's all muscle. That's great. Fill it up. Okay, so I'm, gonna, uh, I'm just going to get a little bit of a slow start and let a couple more people in. Um, but basically, here's what we're doing. So I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about in general, an attack vector shared networks. Um, because we're all in a lot more shared networks than we ever were before, and we probably don't think about it quite as much. Um, so we'll, hmm, come on in. OK, so for those of you watching on video, there are a lot of people in the hall, and we're finding ways to stack them around the room. And Yeah, I'm not pissed. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, I think that I think the goons actually deserve quite another round of applause here. Go goons! <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, I've been asked to reiterate, and I think it's really, really important because, gosh, if anything bad happens in this room, I'm about one of the last people that's going to be able to get out. So uh, <laughs> I want to reiterate that we, uh, you can't block doors. You absolutely cannot block doors. It's not good to block doors. That is how people die. And I do not mean the people that you block from getting out. I mean you as you get trampled really, really badly. Really badly. It's no, no, no fun. So first, don't block doors. Second, keep a clear aisle for some definition of aisle. That means goons should be able to run down, and they may just do it as like a test. And again, the goons are called goons for a reason. So <laughs> don't block the aisles either. Okay, wow. This is really a lot of fun. I'm, I'm already having fun with this, and it's, I, I haven't even gotten to the table of contents. Rock. <laughs> this is just cool. Um, okay, so let's see. So what we're, we're going to talk about is basically um, just one of the things I like to do every now and then, I think we all do, is basically say what kinds of, what kinds of, what kinds of maybe bad assumptions are we making or what kinds, of, what kinds of issues have we kind of left behind as things that we dealt with a long time ago or that we figure, you know, isn't much of a problem anymore. Um, I, I, have my, I have my own favorite sets of them. Um, you know, patching's a real fun one. I know, patching's like one of the most boring things, but we start going and looking and saying, okay, how long does it take between when someone, when, the, uh, when a Microsoft patch comes out and when it gets reverse engineered and turned into a weaponable exploit, and that number's like under a day by far, um, 
And then, you know, we look and we say our average patch time is like three months. I mean, you know, not all of us because we're in this room, but like, you know, nationwide, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. Anyway, it's kind of patching is one of those boring little things that we kind of left behind, and well, it's actually the thing that's going to kill us one day, which from talking to Dan is basically what's going on with DNS2. Um, and I think he's right. Okay, so, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about, we're going we're to have a little bit of fun. Um, we're going to talk about shared networks, and uh, not that much, but we're going to talk about what happens when you share a network with me, I mean, uh, with a bad guy, um, with somebody who's up to no good and, and possibly has forgotten their, you know, laws and all kinds of ethics and stuff like that. Um, and we're going to talk about how you can use these kinds of attacks to, ex to exploit a good number of sites, um, including Gmail and LinkedIn and LiveJournal and honestly tons and tons and tons of sites um, way, way, way too easily. And we'll talk about how you can do it against sites that are actually not as vulnerable, um, like, the on like online banks. And we'll talk about um, what you can do when you're sharing a network with someone. You can start Trojan software installation and update, and that was really fun to learn about, and I'll tell you how I learned about that later on. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, browser exploits um, and how it gets a heck of a lot easier when you're not trying to get somebody halfway across the country or the planet to click on a link. Uh, because you can make them go where you want, and we'll get to that. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about what you can do to try to survive uh, hostile networks. Um, I think DEF CON's been rated by, you know, at least 14 intelligence agencies as the most hostile network in the world. Okay, that's made up, but... But I could see it being true. Um, I, I, every year I bring a laptop here, and I, you know, when I get home, I, I burn the laptop. No, I... <laughs> I burned the hard drive. I pulled the hard drive out. It was a fresh one that went in before I, before I got here. It didn't have any real data on it. I just installed the, I installed some kind of, well, it used to be Linux distribution, but now it's, it's Apple. But it's a good, it's good. Um, Apple, yay. Um, so, uh, but anyway, and you know, I get home and I, and I don't torch the laptop anymore because they've gotten expensive, but I torch the hard drive and I like, you know, and then I grind it up in little bits and then I kind of wait for a really, really, really windy day and I go out to like one of the places where they used to test airplanes, like the, not like normal airplanes with jet engines and stuff, I mean like the Wright Brothers kind of thing, and I try to throw up the hard drive bits into the wind. Okay, well, I'm getting way, way, way off topic. <laughs> But this is DEF CON, so we get to do, because you have gotta, gotta assume that we're going to, that we're gonna have a whole lot of fun, and that's what we're here to do, and wow, this is a blast every single year. Um, so let's see. Um, deal is basically HTTP, or let's call it non-encrypted, non-encrypted web traffic, whatever you wanna call it, non-encrypted HTTP, um, and shared networks, networks you share with, well, anybody bad, or anybody who might wanna be bad, or anybody who might spend a little bit of time being bad, and otherwise is a perfectly reasonable DEF CON speaker. Um, uh, you go to these, you go to these hostile, you go to these, uh, you go to all these shared networks, and we don't really think about how many times we share a network. We all got, I mean, it's, it's really been fun watching the security industry and, I mean, watching our community because, you know, we had to fight so darn hard to get companies and people to use firewalls. And we're not done yet because I, I tell you, one of the most fun things to do is to actually put an outbound firewall on your machine and find out about all the things that, well, used to go out without you knowing about it. I put this little thing called Little Snitch on my laptop for a little while. And I started watching all the stuff that was talking to everywhere. And I started realizing there were a ton of people who are still, you know, at home. They're not behind any kind of an ad box. They're not behind, behind really anything of a firewall or much of a firewall. And I know this because, well, my, my machine's going and doing Skype to them. And, and it's doing all, it's just, I'm looking at it and saying, oh my gosh. But anyway, assuming that we've all got these great firewalls and so on, we think we're pretty safe. And, and it's nice. We've gotten a lot safer. But... Then we get on these wireless networks with people, and, and you know, Dave Maynard and Johnny Cash taught us a couple years ago that even having our wireless card on might be dangerous. Um, and, uh, okay, well, you know, if we don't join the network, I, I don't have anything that lead. Um, I wish I did, but I don't. Um, but on the other hand, what I do have is, is just, if we go and start looking at actually everything that leaks out of your laptop, it's pretty amazing. Um, I'm not going to go after everything that leaks out of your laptop. I'm pretty amazed at how much I see when I sniff a network. Um, of course, legally, I, it's always one I'm trying to protect. That's why I'm sniffing it. It's the only reason I'd ever sniff a network or glue or anything. No, no. <laughs> DEF CON speakers do not sniff glue. They apparently, I think, have a lot harder stuff. Um, so anyway, 
So yeah, I mean, and, and if you think about it, you might be like, well, no, I never use any shared networks. And honestly, I live in Seattle now. This is like the place where like coffee houses are huge. Everyone's in the coffee houses. They're all on the Wi-Fi, and it's all free. And there's free Wi-Fi everywhere. We've got the Seattle Wireless. We've got the Seattle Wireless community. It's just huge. And you find it everywhere. You're constantly going on wireless networks in hotels. Not in this one. Not on my life. Um, but but you know you're going on wireless networks in hotels. You're going on wireless networks. You know if you go to a non-security conference, you might turn your laptop on. Um, you know you might turn the wireless card on your laptop on and, and you know join on. You might even pay, be paying for it. Heck, you could be paying for the wireless networks, and they're still not really any safer. You're sharing it with a whole bunch of people who may or may not be bad. Um, or who may or may not have had bad people install bad things on their laptop, even though they're good. Um, so you know, we go to coffee shops, we go to bookstores. Um, you know, actually, there was a really there's there's been a series of great talks. One was Simple Nomad talking about going on an airplane and uh, starting to just you know finding people with their wireless card on, and he would go and set up a little network with them, and you know start seeing what he could see. I'm sure that he didn't do that. It's all fictional stories, um, but. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, the, the deal is, especially with wireless, we're all on shared networks with lots of bad people all the time, and it's really kind of nice um, to think about, well, maybe it's not, but I, I, I think it's nice. I think it's nice to think about what people can do and what people are doing. And you open yourselves up to a heck of a lot of attack. You also open yourself up to a whole lot of monitoring. I don't know anybody who does this, or if I did know them, I wouldn't have known their name um, or anything like that. But I, I've heard there are lots of people who will go on wireless networks and just simply set up a, a sniffer of some sort and just start watching passwords go by. Well, and, and so you know, a lot of the a lot of the services that would have clear text passwords go by started saying, "Wait, we've heard of this wall of sheep thing, um, and that's not good. So we're going to start we're going to we're going to encrypt we're going to encrypt something. We'll encrypt those passwords." And so now, you know, my friends who I don't know the names of, um, who would be, you know, sniffing on these wireless networks, they don't see passwords go by anymore. But they see IM conversations, and they see email going by, and they see all kinds of wonderful clear text stuff. This is, this is what you've got to kind of understand, and this is what you've got to tell your friends, you've got to tell your family, you've got to tell your, you've got to tell your places of employ, and you've got to tell everybody uh, on the earth. If we share a LAN, if you and I share a LAN, I can view and modify your traffic. Okay, um, whether or not in modifying it I break it because and it doesn't work, it's useless to me and useless to you. Well, that's that's different. If it's clear text, for the most part, I get to view and modify it, and I have a lot of fun. By the way, this is one of the one of the I, I have. I don't really have rants. I'm a pretty nice guy. I, I don't think anybody's ever said, "Wow, that Jay, he's grumpy," right? But but I have all these I have all these weird thoughts about things, and uh, you know, and things that kind of bug me because I, I start to think about it, and I say, you know, we're always talking. Whenever we're talking, I mean, I'm a I'm a consultant, or you can call us a, a consultant. Uh, we do sell our time by the hour and all that. But um, but um. But you know, I go and I talk to lots and lots of companies, and we and we sit down. And one of the things we do is we talk about you know before we start hacking anything or looking at firewalls or whatever we're going to do, we kind of say, well, you know, what are the threats? What are the threats that are most? What are the biggest things that could harm the business? And when we do that, we say, okay, they start talking about the data that the data that bad guys could see that they shouldn't be able to see. They could see secret stuff, and they say, and they could take things down. They could do denial of service. And they always, always, I swear, always forget the last one. Everybody knows that first one is confidentiality. And that, well, kind of last one, but I've reordered it, is availability. Anybody know what the middle one is? Integrity. Integrity. Oh, God, wait. Who the hell cares if I can see that data? Sometimes it's really good that I can see it. But what if I could change it? What if I could change it and you didn't know I changed it? And what if I could do that, you know, all the time? And I think that's one of the things we're going to talk about in this talk. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about how, with good tools, or you know, honestly, with even bad tools, um, you can get at the integrity part just as much as the confidentiality. You can have a heck of a lot more fun with the integrity. It's a lot more fun, and we'll get into the kinds of attacks. But what you need to understand is, if you're sharing a LAN with me, especially a wireless LAN, they wireless it brought back the broadcast domain. You know, we all had hubs, and it was like really crazy because you could like tell your network card to just tell you everything that went by on the wire instead of just the stuff that was for it. And all of a sudden, you'd be like, "Wow, I can see everybody's traffic. That's really cool." And then, well, that's been kind of a decade since that was really all the way true. You know, we got switches, and these switches were really nice. And now we can only see your stuff. And well, unless you played some games, which we'll talk about. But um, but on a wireless network, oh wow, we all went broadcast again. 
I mean, we went really broadcast. I don't just mean like the packet goes into a hub and the hub sends it out in all the directions. I mean, dude, I can be really, really far away. As long as I've got a really nice antenna, I can be really, really far away and watch all of your traffic. And you don't know it. And you didn't have to do anything. And I didn't have to throw any packets. You don't even know I'm doing it. That's, well, anyway, so we'll get into that. Um, so the thing you got to understand is I can, if we're on a LAN together um, and I'm bad, uh, I'm looking at your traffic. And I can do this in a bunch of different ways. One of my favorite ideas is just to stand up your own DHCP server. I mean, you know, you could, you could go and play games with the switches, but why not just stand up your own DHCP server? I mean, everybody just kind of expects they'll put their laptop on a network and their laptop will go and try to get an IP address. And the, it, they figure that the, the box that gives it to them will probably be a nice friendly one that was supposed to be on the network. But honestly, DHCP is this wonderful broadcast thing, right? It's like, hey, does anybody have an IP address for me, me, me? And it says, and somebody wins a race. Somebody races back and says, I do. And sometimes that's the right somebody. And sometimes it's the wrong somebody. Now, I'm going to tell you guys something. Because we're at a hacker con, and I've been on a lot of good networks gone bad, um, if you're going to do that to me, if you're going to give me a DHCP lease instead of the, re instead of the real person, you're going to do any of these network games, please route my packets. <laughs> I mean, really, how many of us have gone on a network and we're like, Okay, the network's down. What's going on? There's some, ah, oh, some fool's like, some fool's trying to sniff all the traffic. He sent all the traffic to him, but he's not bothering to route it because he's clueless and stupid or lazy or whatever. Or he stopped a long time ago, but he didn't put the network back the way he found it. Which really, you gotta think, there's gotta be some kind of ethics to doing bad things. I mean, you can be bad. <laughs> But there's like levels of badness, you know? There's like, there's like kind of, you know, there's, I don't know, there's like shoving somebody in line or cutting in line. And then there's like, you know, eating a kitten. The eating a kitten is really bad, okay? And I would posit that if you're gonna watch my traffic, if you're gonna route, if, if you're gonna have all, your, all my traffic go to your box and you don't bother to route it out to the internet where I was trying to get, that's eating the kitten. Just don't do that. Okay, so, so here we are. Um, so the DHCP server is a nice way of doing things. Another nice way of doing things, and, and it's amazingly simple and easy, um, is you can run a little tool like ARP spoof or EdderCap or whatever, and you can run a little tool that'll basically say, hi, um, I'm the router. Uh, everybody who wants to go out, you come to me. And if you wanted to be really, really careful about it or really, really targeted, you could be like, no, I'm, I'm that one server. That's the really, really highly important server. But honestly, most of us, if we were bad uh, and we were going in, we just, you know, we just want to be a router. Maybe we want to actually, honestly, in honor of Dan, um, maybe we want to be the DNS server. That's a good person to be, too, because you start saying, wow, everybody who like, asks for www.livejournal.com, uh, uh, that's my laptop. And they're not ever going to know the difference. Anyway, so we'll, we'll get to that. But this is, I think this is kind of fun. Anyway, uh, yeah, I added the slide. I added a slide I forgot about adding, but I added it. Um, DNS is a beautiful, beautiful thing to an attacker, and we wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about it. UDP protocols are so beautiful because they're so much easier to spoof, and they're just, it's just, there's just, it's just so much. It makes things worlds easier. And it's a beautiful thing for an attacker, and Dan, I read Dan's slides. I missed his talk before, but I'm gonna see it. But, but Dan has some really good ideas here. Uh, DNS is a wonderful thing to an attacker, absolutely. Um, what I really like, you know, on the one hand, you could spoof DNS replies to everybody on the network, and that doesn't go away as a threat. We don't really have much of anything we can do about it. Okay, if you happen to put your laptop on a network at the same on the same network, and and I send out a DNS and I send out a DNS request, and you watch it go by, you can respond to it, and quite possibly, very often, trust me, DNS spoof is a great tool. You can respond to it faster than the real DNS server. Um, part of that is because, well you already know the answer, well, the fake answer, whereas it might have to go and do work to find out where, you know, finance.yahoo.com is, um, or such. Anyway, um, the other really cool thing about DNS is if you can poison it, if you can poison DNS for like an hour, or five minutes, or 10 minutes, or whatever, you can get an SSL cert. Because honestly, the way they do SSL certs is kind of simple. It's, it's uh, you apply for an SSL cert, if you can get email for the domain for a short time, uh, then, uh, you've got the SSL cert. And revocation's really amazingly difficult if it all works. Um, so basically the people who own the domain for real have to wait for it to expire. Um, so, um, okay, well I'll get to some more, I'll get to some more man in the middle stuff. But I think that this is, this is good stuff to think about. We trust our networks way too much. Um, so if we share a LAN, did I go back a slide? 
Um, hmm. Okay, so let me get on to some of the let me get on some more of the meat. I've been playing, I've been man in the middling all of my web traffic for about three months, and I've been having a heck of a lot of fun doing it. And I've been surprised at well how much of it goes by clear text, and how much stuff is in there, and how much stuff is persistent, and and uh, and now I'm afraid of Google too. Um, but I'll get to that. Um, so basically, part of what I want to say is that you know beyond just the straight, this website is clear text. Sites that are mixed between clear text and not so clear text, or between you know HTTP. And then whatever you want to call it, SSL, TLS, encrypted, encrypted web traffic, they're, I'll call them a menace. I think it's a reasonable thing. Um, and the problem is that uh, anytime you're unencrypted, I get to watch. But remember, I'm into integrity. I don't just get to watch. I can clone your session. Okay? I can throw in whatever I want. If I can route your packets for you, and, and I try to say that that's actually pretty easy and trivial and we all knew how to do that a long time ago, if I can route your packets for you, well, then I can take any of the ones that you know, will let me, any of the clear text ones, and you know, change them if I want. I could, honestly, I could keep them for myself and not send them on to their real destination. And I could send my own stuff on to the real destination. And then when the answers came back, I could hold on to that. And I could send you something else. And if you start scripting this, if you start going programmatic, you can really do a whole lot. Um, I kind of Part of the way I got the, an idea for this was basically the idea of taking a, a, a user who's signing into webmail and saying, wait, if I can get them onto my webmail server instead of their real webmail server, I can control their whole like email world. I know that sounds really overblown, but really, it's I can sit there and say, okay, well, I don't want them to see this email that came in. So I'm just going to make sure that in the view that they're getting of the data, they never see that email. Maybe they never see any email from this person. Maybe this is, you know, maybe I'm, you know, I don't know. I, let me think of something bad. Uh, I don't know. We're both trying to date the same girl, maybe. Um, and, he, you know, this guy's never going to get an email from her anymore. Um, and, heck, I'm going to send some email from him to her saying, I don't ever want to talk to you again. <laughs> right? And she's not going to know unless she goes out of band. But, you know, but we've got VoIP and I'm working on it. Right? So... <laughs> So anyway, we've got this. So it's it's really, I mean, you really, it's really freaking crazy um, because you could put you could put someone in their own little email matrix, and they don't know they they don't know they're in the matrix. They think that they're just going to their mail site as per normal, and um, and it's not that hard. And I wrote a tool to do this kind of stuff. So anyway, um, one of the this is actually one of the things that got me thinking about this was basically in we were you know we've been doing we do a lot of web app hacking. I do a lot of web app hacking, and it's really really fun and it's great stuff. Um, but constantly, we talk to we talk to companies, and they and we say, you know, your users are logging in, and you're encrypting their password, and then after that, you're leaving the whole session unencrypted. And they say, well, we protected the password. You can't get the password. And I say, the problem is that if I share a network with them, not to be repetitious, but if I share a network with them, I can see everything they send, but more than that, I can impersonate them. And I can impersonate them for, well, about as long as I can manage to keep a clone session. Um, so it's really kind of, I mean, I can, with most applications, I can be in the application, they can be in the application, we can both be in at the same time, we're both the same user, and they may not ever know I'm there. They may not ever know what I'm up to. If I'm just grabbing data, they'll never really know. If I'm modifying data, I could be subtle. Um, so anyway, I mean, this is one of the, I take LinkedIn as an example, but I only take LinkedIn as an example because it was just one of the ones I was thinking about. It's one of the ones, it's one of the sites that we all, you know, that I think a lot of people in this room use. But LinkedIn is this great, is this great site. You can go to, you can, like many, many people, just go to www.linkedin.com. And you'll have an unencrypted session. And then when you go to do your password, it'll be encrypted. And then when you're done, you'll go unencrypted. And you could say, no, I'm, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to make sure that I'm not going to Jay's version of LinkedIn. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to the right one. So you'll, so you'll type HTTPS colon slash slash, you know, www.linkedin.com, right? And that'll actually give you some assurance that you're actually getting to the real LinkedIn, not to me instead, and then I'm going to forward things on. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, the difficulty is that you'll go, there, you'll, go to that, you'll go to that encrypted site, you'll log in, great, and then LinkedIn will, give you, will, will take you back to clear text. Um, and you may say, well, but I can keep typing HTTPS. And the problem is they keep giving you pages back that have, well, clear text links all over them. So you're just stuck. Um, and that's just how the site operates. And it's really, really no fun. Um, so that's our, that's our red link. That's where you go. So if you change the URL, clicking on any, on any link basically just gets you back to not so SSL, not so encrypted. Um, Anyway, there are there are people out there that have made that have made modifications to browsers. They've gone and gotten plugins. Um, they've 
do like me and surf through a defensive proxy. Um, and basically, they make it so that all of their all of their stuff is going whenever the site will permit it is going encrypted every single time. So they just keep making encrypted. And a lot of applications will let you do that, but not all of them. Um, but anyway, the nice thing for me as an attacker, it's really a lot nicer to be an attacker. I'm telling you, it's like way better to be on the attack side of this one. Okay, as an attacker, all I've got to do is wait for one request to go by, and I get to clone session, and maybe I get to inject some things. I might inject some JavaScript or inject some redirects. Um, so, you know, let's let's look at let's kind of start thinking about what I can do. So. One of the first things I do is basically I'm going to get your machine to go to my machine. Maybe it's going to my machine because it thinks it's the router. Maybe it's going to my machine because it thinks it's the DNS server or the real web server or what have you. But I'll do that in general. I'll do it through ARP spoofing. Um, I might do it through I might do it through D, I might do it through DNS spoofing and I might do it through DHCP spoofing. Um, and none of that's really all that hard. I mean, there are nice command line tools for everything but the DHCP spoofing. And the DHCP spoofing, well, you can use Scapy or HPing or whatever, or you can just stand up your own stand up your own DHCP server that has the same settings as the real one, because um, they're kind of public. You can figure out which which IPs are taken, and you know, go and assign the rest. You could be really friendly. Um, you know, I, I I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I uh, have, have thought about this. But this is really kind of the way that DHCP thing works. If I can beat the DHCP server and give you an answer before the real one does, well, everything's going to work just fine as long as the real DHCP server doesn't give out your address. So if I kind of watch what addresses it's giving out and give you and say, okay, well, it's not going to get to this last 20 for a while, so I'll, I'll give out those. It's kind of like this guy, this happened to my wife like a week ago, it's kind of like the guy that stands out in the parking lot and the parking attendant in that, in that lot, if there is an attendant, doesn't really wear a jacket or uniform and he just goes up to, you know, people are parking their cars and says, hey, it's $5 and, you know, writes them a receipt and then walks away from the lot and you get a ticket and you're like, what the heck? Um, this is, you know, yet another way where you're not really quite sure who you're talking to. Somebody got friendly. They said you can have that spot. No problem. Uh, okay. So what kinds of things you can, can you do? I can start injecting clear, I, I can inject anything into your traffic. If it's clear text, I get to inject anything I want. It's fun, it's really good. I can inject it in, your, in both directions. So I can inject JavaScript into clear text traffic. I can go and take your session keys. So, you know, like, HTTP is this really, you know, web is this really, really crazy little protocol that kind of was invented as file transfer, for the most part, right? It's, it was kind of glorified file transfer, pretty fast glorified file transfer, but glorified file transfer with this nice hyperlinking stuff. And then we've like gone and basically made everything web. Um, I mean everything, and we'll talk about that, but it's, we've made everything web, and so that's really nice. But the thing is, as glorified file transfer, it doesn't have any state. So we bolted on this weird thing called cookies and said, okay, I'm gonna, as the server, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna tell your browser, hey, every time you talk to me, I want you to remind me that you're user number 45, because otherwise I'm not gonna know you're saying, you're, that you're user number 45, that you're user J. So I'm gonna remember, J logged in, he gave me his password, and in exchange for his password, I gave him this session ID. I gave him this cookie. I gave him this thing. I gave him a number. I gave him 45, you know, like at a, at a deli counter. And I said, okay, every time you talk to me, remind me that you're number 45 so I can remember that you're Jay, so I don't have to ask you for your password every single time. Okay, cool. So we've got this, we've got this session cookies, but if anybody watches that number go by, very much like the deli counter um, or the whatever, or the pharmacy or what have you, they can kind of come up and say, hi, I'm number 45. And they say, oh, good, I'm so glad to see you, number 45. Here's your prescription. Um, right, this is, anyway, it kind of works very much the same way with web apps. So if I've got session key, if I've got your session keys, if I can see them once, well, then that means I can start up my own parallel session. And some web apps are really nice and actually say, wait, there's two of you. And I'll knock one of you off. And I'll probably win the race, but you'll probably notice me. So I guess that's better than if, like, you know, we just were both there and you never noticed me, but it's still not great. Um, so there are other things I can do. I can intercept your logout request. So you go and say logout, and I'm like, wait, if you log out, I this session, this session hijacking thing or this session cloning thing doesn't work so well. So I'm not going to let you log out. You try to log out. If I'm proxying all your traffic, if all your traffic's routing through me, then I'll just say uh, logouts. No, I'm not permitting those. Um, and if I know the application I'm dealing with ahead of time. Instead of just, you know, this is one of the things we, this is one of the things with existing tools, right? If I know the application ahead of time and I know this is the logout link, well, I can just make sure that any time you send anything that matches this given regular expression, ooh, reg apps, um, then uh, I'm not going to let it go by. But I'll let everything else you do go by, just not that one. Okay, so what else can I do? I can replace, and this is his idea. Um, um, it is, I think. Um, at least 
I think I had it, but then I forgot it. <laughs> but that's like so many ideas we've all had, because I'm pretty sure every idea I've ever had, somebody else has had before, and not just one, like 15,000. Um, so anyway, this, this, uh, I can go through and I can replace HTTPS links with HTTP links. Um, and this is something really, really cool. This is something that we're actually doing, that we're actually doing in the Middler. Um, uh, this is part of the reason the Middler is, well, not entirely working right now, because uh, we added some functionality at the very last minute. But on the other hand, it's cool functionality, it's better. So now, um, well, I'll go into it. I've got a slide on it that talks about exactly how it, how it works. So the Middler basically does this. The Middler has two kinds of modes. One is an interactive mode. And that interactive mode is somewhat similar to, to existing tools. Um, except that it actually is there to make it kind of brain dead easy for you to clone for you to clone other people's sessions instead of having to be a web app hacker instead of having to be or a web app programmer or somebody really you know could follow this and it takes a while it takes it really does take a little while with some of these apps to go and profile them and say okay well these are the cookies I need and these are the requests that I need and so on if we we've, we've spent some time we've spent some time with different apps and said okay this is what this is what's login this is what's log out these are the session cookies I need these are the, these are the things and what we're doing is basically doing something non-interactive, but I've gotten ahead of myself. We've got this interactive thing, and basically what you can do is if one person is surfing through the, if, if, if one person is surfing through the proxy, unbeknownst to them, um, and you're the bad guy who set up the proxy, you can go to the proxy and clone their session by just, you know, I can just, if I'm going through the proxy and I'm coming from my, I'm coming from my IP address, well then when I try to go to, you know, when I try to go to LinkedIn or LiveJournal, I'll go in as somebody else and I can choose the somebody else, but I can go in as somebody else that's on the proxy right now and maybe as many of them. So that part's we're kind of all used to. I mean, we don't do that so much because the existing tools kind of make it easy to watch, but not so easy to actually, well, modify. Again, integrity, not confidentiality. Well, both, but integrity is really fun. Okay, or more to the point, attacking it. Um, so the first part, so we can do this, this is kind of the interactive parts, um, the parts that are, you know, you're really gonna do, and, and this is human, this is at human speed, but I, I, like, I like machine speed better, it's faster. But it, at human speed, we can actually go, and basically, you know, we can just clone someone's session and make that really easy, and you don't have to go and sit there and figure out which things you need to clone, which things are being changed, which things you need to hold static, screw that, let the proxy do it for you. So that's the first thing the Middler does, and it's very and it's and it's a and it's a useful thing. We can also just start saying, you know what? As long as you're going as long as you're going to be able to to clone someone's session, as long as you're going to be able to proxy their session, and, and you know, look at every single bit that comes through and change whatever you want, we can actually start going through and injecting JavaScript and other links into the page. You can put whatever links you want, but I like JavaScript because it means you can send somebody to links they didn't want to go to. Um, you could put in pictures, as we've all seen, with some really disgusting pictures. Um, you can go through and, you know, and we tend to see it here. I don't know why that is, but um, but you can go through and put in your own, and I like this a lot because you turning off JavaScript doesn't really save you one bit. This is part of HTTP. You could go and actually start putting in your own redirects. So you can say, hey, you know what? I'm going to decide that uh, I'm going to decide that every other user, or only these three users, or whatever, are going to be redirected to the site of my choice. And that site of my choice might be, I don't know, it might be my own vanity site, but that wouldn't be nearly as fun or nearly as evil. I could make it a phishing site, but that uh, that's not any that's not all that much fun. What I'd really like to do is redirect them to, I don't know, Metasploit. Yeah, client-side exploits. So that would be fun. Or I could redirect them over to, uh, you know, anybody heard of Beef, the browser exploitation framework? That thing's really fun. This guy, Kevin Johnson, who's like taught everybody a lot, um, is like got me really into this idea and I'm, I'm, I'm blown away from some of the demos I've seen. I need to play with it more myself. But, but this is pretty easy. Um, you can, you know, we can go through and do some of the normal stuff like logging the users, the user's whole session. And the middler's actually got some, some really nice stuff. Again, trying to go, back, go and basically take previous tools to a really, really different level. The middler's actually got some stuff in there so that we can parse out the XML that's going by. We can parse out JSON. JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's like what Google uses to send your mail back and forth. So if you can parse it, it like gets a whole lot easier to read somebody else's mail or throw some in there or delete some or whatever. But we're making it so that the intent is to make it really, really easy, um, not only for you to do this interactively, but for you to add on to it, because that's the idea. It's like I'm this kind of weird open source guy, and well, this is open source attack tools. So. Um, I'm going to tell you that it's going to be really easy. I'm not going to get to write documentation this weekend by far about how to do it, but it's going to be pretty easy for you to add more and more sites. Um, there's also, the really fun stuff to me though also is this kind of doing some site specific features. And, and this is a little weird because you say, wait, I can do all this with a browser, but I'm going to kind of go into some of the stuff you might do. So the first is, suppose uh, Gmail and Webmail, Gmail, Yahoo Mail, all the different Webmails. 
Most of these web mails all basically leave almost the entire session clear text, which means, ding, ding, we can all have fun with them. So what kinds of things might you do with Gmail? Um, well, you might read the user's email, which is kind of the obvious. And by read the user's email, I don't just mean their email, but their, you know, the email that they're reading, but also all their other email, you know, and go through the folders. And the whole in part of the intent of the middler is to go and say, listen, why do this at human speed? Let's do this programmatically. Let's say, listen, if I'm watching Justin, read his Gmail, you know, it's like, it's, it's nice, I can go and click on a link and see what his message is and all that, I hit compose and send a message, yeah, whatever. What I really want to do is just harvest all of his messages all at once, and I want to do it before I even knew about it. I want to do it while I'm off drinking or, you know, whatever it is I do, eating sushi, because I don't really drink so much, but sushi, that I do. Um, but so the, uh, you know, I want to make that really, really, really easy, and, um, and that's the intent. We're basically automating the, I don't want to use that word. Okay, so we're automating the, the oh, that's a bad word too. <laughs> um, gee, I don't have any curse. How do you not curse at DEF CON? Yeah, we're automating the crap out of it. Um, absolutely, positively. Um, anyway, so you can go through and you can read their email, but you can go beyond that. As long as you're logged into Google as them and you didn't need their password, you're just writing their session. Why not do a whole bunch more? Why not read all their past Google Talk conversations? I think about that and I think, oh gosh, I've used Google Talk with my wife, my friends, my coworkers. Sheesh. Um, and why not harvest their whole address book? I mean, you know, we probably don't care about that so much, but if you were a professional spammer, a professional fisher, a professional, well, if you wanted to send client side exploits to all of their friends or all of their coworkers or whatever, that might be really useful too. Um, and we could send our own emails. We could do that programmatically so we can send tons of emails and they all look like they came from this guy and he can't prove that it wasn't him. Right? It, 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 you follow the headers and you're like, yeah, this was absolutely him. You can go and profile the user in all the other Google applications. Awesome. Um, you can profile the user in all the other Google applications. And, you know, since you can prevent that, since you can prevent him from logging out, he thinks he's logged out. And you're going to keep using that session for a long, long, long time. When I start thinking about all the Google applications, I really get scared. I love Google. I love all the stuff they give me. They give me all this wonderful functionality, most of it through my browser and even through my phone. That's really, really cool. But every so often I think, gosh, wow, you know, if I were Google, I, I have a lot of information on a lot of people. You know, I'd, I'd almost want to sell that stuff. But if I didn't sell it, I, maybe I'd just like one day I'd be like, you know, screw this ad stuff. We're going to be an intelligence agency because we already know it all. I mean, we don't know it, it's all, but it's all in there. We just have to mine through it and find it all. Um, anyway, uh, hopefully Google won't get mad at me and publish all of my stuff on the internet somewhere or, you know, whatever. But um, be nice. Um, okay, so it's, it's kind of crazy. Imagine not so much what happens if, if, you know, don't think so much about what would happen if somebody could get to your Google data, right? Because you're like, no, I'm too smart for that. I would never use Gmail for anything that wasn't absolutely public. Right? I know you're all like that, I'm not. So why don't you think instead about what would happen if you could get, get to all of my Google data? What would happen if you could get to those, those docs and those spreadsheets and you know, my email and my chat conversations and my bookmarks and, and my browsing history? I mean, Google will show you your own, so uh, as long as you're cloning somebody's session, why not look at theirs? I mean, you know, mine, I guess. So. Please be nice when you're looking at all of it and, you know, keep it to yourself. It's, it'll be just between you and me and you and you and you and you. Okay. Um, but this is bad. You shouldn't do it, so please don't go and do this stuff to me. Please. I, I Please. Pretty please. So other sites. I think Live Journal is a really fun one to think about, too. Um, this is one of the reasons I targeted it um, as one of the first sites to do this within the tool. Um, and Live Journal really shows you the power of, I think Live Journal really shows you the power of doing this programmatically. Live Journal is a blogging site, but to call Live Journal another blogging site is kind of really under, underestimating what it does. People think of Live Journal as a private thing. I don't know who, who in here has actually got a Live Journal. I know we're, we're all kind of getting older, so it's. Oh, more of you do than that. I read some of yours. Okay, so this so this live journal thing can get really popular, um, especially you know, especially among you know young adults. But basically, live journals this blogging site where people kind of expect that a lot of their blog posts will be private. They mark their blog posts as just for me. You know, it's like your own little journal site, your own little diary. But they also mark their posts as just for me and my friends. My friends can know this, but nobody else can because this is really embarrassing. I, I, I don't want everyone to know about how drunk I got last weekend or whatever it was. But they can actually do something else. I started finding out from my friends who use LiveJournal far more than I do because I've logged into it like, I don't know, you know, once a month or something. Um, but, you know, I've talked to people and they have all these filters set up. They said, this is one group of friends, this is one group of friends, this is another group of friends, this is another group of friends. This group can know about my career, but this group can't. And this group can know about my sex life, but this group can't. And so on and so on and so on. I'm serious. I'm serious. I could... I could, yeah. So anyway, 
Um, but they have this expectation of privacy, and yet it's also clear text, which means you could programmatically with a proxy, if you could get them to surf through the proxy, which just means you have to be on a, you know, on a wireless network with them, which, oh, <laughs> that's ever going to happen with somebody who blogs? They, people got a blog from everywhere, right? Um, so, you know, you can go through and read their private and their friends-only journal entries, but you can do more than that. You could go and make them all public if you wanted to. Um, you could make some of them public. You could make some of them that aren't supposed to be seen by one of their groups of friends visible, you know, to that group of to that group of people who would be offended or what have you. You could go through and harvest their friends list and then go look at all of their friends' private posts. And if you did this programmatically, which is what we do in the Middler, you'd get a lot of it really fast, and um, and it would be kind of fun. Um, anyway, you could even start, you know, you could even give yourself more privilege. You could add your, you know, you could add your own user to the victims list, and now we've got something like Sammy all over again. And there have been some really great talks about social networking at Black Hat and DEF CON this year, and yes. Um, so LinkedIn's another good one, same kind of thing. Just imagine the same kind of thing. It's just we all kind of have this expectation of LinkedIn that, you know, um, Justin's my friend, he can have my phone number. Um, he can have all my phone numbers, he can have my home phone number, that's okay, but I'm not sure that I want everyone to have it, That's you know, so whatever. Um, um, I, I want to go a little bit further. What's wrong with this picture? Um, this is actually pretty hard to see, but this is Cleartext banking site. This is a Cleartext. This is U.S. Bank. This is the front page of their site. Okay, it's Cleartext. But you'll note, and I've blown it up a bit. There's some locks over here where you put in your personal ID. Okay, this is where you put in your username, and there are locks, and those locks are there to make you feel very safe. Okay, so why are they there to make you feel safe? Well, that this form where you put your login ID, it's, it's encrypted, it's okay, it's SSL. So we're all supposed to feel safe. And I remember back when I did feel safe with that, and I felt really dumb, and once I figured it out, I said, wait a second, what if, since you had to go, since you went to a clear text site first, doesn't that mean that that SSL page, that, that SSL link doesn't have to be SSL, and you may not even ever know it wasn't SSL, and most of us don't look for it. I mean, honestly, Justin, you made a good point. You made a good point about this. He said, wait, I'm a security guy. Great. He said, I'm a security guy, and I don't always notice if it's gone SSL or not. I don't, I don't always notice. I, I'm, okay, just so I'm not just making fun of him, I don't always notice, okay? I found out how much was clear text by sticking an outbound, sticking this little, little snitch outbound firewall on my machine and saying, what? Okay, so anyway, uh, this is a banking site that, you know, if you wanted to, you could fool a tremendous number of people into just, well, never going encrypted. And this is actually, this is actually something, let's see, yeah, we have it here. This is what, this is what the Midler does, um, and this is one of Justin's big contributions, so yeah, you should speak to it, because I keep talking. Yeah, not a problem. Um, so originally, Jay had this nice, beautiful, beautiful program. Nice little thing. I came up, and, uh, well, it's Python. It's beautiful. Um, and he asked me to go ahead and, and if I could help him out try to finish up some of the nice functionality for the nice demo for, for everybody here at DEF CON. And I said, sure, why not? Good friend that I am. Get out my ice, nice little ice pick and start uh, reverse engineering some programs, trying to, to get some nice little point and click stuff in there for everybody. And uh, we started this nice little conversation. I was like, hey, Jay, you know your, your concept right now is, is we have these secure websites and, and your tool only works if the first page is unsecure, if it's unencrypted. And your solution to try to gain some additional information is we're just going to head and try Wait. to inject some JavaScript, um, do some other tricks that, that everybody's really heard. Uh, and, and that was kind of the, the backbone of the, the tool. And honestly, part of it was I was just going to wait. I was like, wait, they're going to go through the encrypted part, and then they'll be clear text again. But Justin but, said we didn't have to wait. But wait a minute. We're, we're already man in the middle of them. We have control of their connections. All their traffic's floating through us. What if when they go to that clear text password or clear text uh, first page, we never let them get to HTTPS? In the in the middle, we go ahead and we rewrite all the hrefs inside the page, so that they don't have the s. And that and, was, and that was where I said to Justin, wait, wait there's a, a problem. I've been on lots of apps where you know you try to you try to go clear text and it says no 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 this part of the application is only available encrypted. So we allow the proxy to go ahead and stay encrypted. And we basically create a proxy that strips out SSL for the client. And then it kind of keeps track. Well, right now, in a kind of stupid sin cookie kind of way, but <laughs> it kind of keeps track of all the, things that it, all the things that it changed from SSL to not so SSL. All these links that used to be SSL that aren't SSL anymore. It's like, wait, I know that whenever the user surfs to one of those, when they come through me, I got to go and make sure that I 
change them around again, make them SSL again. So we've got this kind of little kludge, but we kind of like it. It, it, it works. Um, which is we just take the URL that was SSL'd and we throw a little, we throw a little cookie in. We were going to do a random number and we probably will eventually, but right now we just, it was proof of concept. We did secure four. Um, and, you know, so we said to the proxy, says, okay, if the user's trying to surf to something through me and I see this uh, and I see secure four, I know that that means I'm supposed to go and pull the secure four out and make sure that I do that session encrypted. User never needs to do that. We're going to keep things just as they are, hunky dory, and it works really well. And honestly, I'm going to tell you, I, I love my family, but they're not IT people and none of them will ever know the difference, um, which is really sad because I'm really working on it, but I'm just not that good a teacher. Okay. So yeah, the only, and then the only problem we really have left is, is most of us are actually typing in the URLs that are by hand. A lot of the secure websites that we're actually going to, most of us go ahead and just type the, the domain and, and it pops right up and it redirects us over to the HTTPS. Um, but occasionally we have bookmarks that go directly to HTTPS. Um, or occasionally we'll actually type in the HTTPS. Absolutely. So the solution for that is we either simply wait for them to go ahead and have the application drop them back out or move over to another website, or if you really want, you can go ahead and, and give them a self-signed certificate and, and broadcast to the world, say, hey, I'm right here, but we all know that uh, how many people actually pay attention to that little thing. Absolutely. But, so we have multiple, di multiple different options there, but given enough time, that person will eventually drop out of SSL mode, eventually find something to click on that is back in SSL mode, and we'll prevent him from ever going back in. Okay, now we're running low on time, so I've skipped a couple slides, but I, I want to get out of just the application, out of the web application space. Um, there's something else that, there's something else I realized, and that was I have a whole lot of software that updates, that self updates, a tremendous amount of software on this laptop right here that's self updating all the time. And the first time I thought about it, it was like, I was like, wow, if anybody were to sniff the wire, they could find out like what versions of software I'm running, they'd figure out which ones were vulnerable, and they could even send me client side exploits specifically targeted to the vulnerable software that I have. And since they're watching me try to update, and they know that update's going to take like 20 minutes to download, they can do it while I'm still downloading the update. How about a race condition there, right? So that's really, really fun. And we've been kind of watching this. We've started looking more and more at this. And uh, there have actually been, I started looking at this and I said, wait, my iPhone, my iPhone's got this, okay, so any Apple people in the crowd? Uh, could you guys like plug your ears? So I might have jailbroken my iPhone, um, and it's possible, or it might have happened to me while I wasn't looking, because um, I went to, actually, I, I probably surfed to a vulnerable, I probably surfed to, an, to a website that was supposed to be all nice, but it, it had an image file that was, you know, bad. It was bad, and, uh, and so my machine, it, it, it got hacked. But one of the things I learned with this installer.app thing that was really, really cool, I mean, the, the, the baddie who hacked my phone, he left me this installer.app thing and, and uh, you know, a love for sushi. And, um, and I realized, wait a second, installer.app, it's like pulling down a software catalog in clear text. <laughs> That's really cool. I can man in the middle of that. Now I can put whatever software I want on the iPhone. Well, I mean, I already could, but, but I'm a baddie, so now I can change the software that's going on. Because if you can do the catalog, if you can man in the middle catalog, then you can actually choose where all the software comes from. And there's some college students, one of them got dis doing this dissertation on it, who basically figured out that he could do this uh, to a whole bunch of open source distributions and what else? Yeah, we can do it. So we're doing it for software installation. We're doing it for software updates. Start watching your software updates. You'll be really, really scared. The other thing is uh, you could exploit vulnerable browsers. And if you want to exploit vulnerable browsers, it's really, really nice if you're man in the middle people because they think they're going to CNN. They think they're going to their own. They think they're going to their own bank site. And uh, wow. <laughs> I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Did they kill them both? Oh, here you go, Jay. Oh. <laughs> you won't get. <laughs>